We will turn to Exodus 20 for our Bible reading, the book of Exodus chapter 20. Let me welcome each one of you to our Bible class here today. We're glad to see you, and we give you a hearty welcome in the Lord's name. And also our webcast viewers, we're glad to have you joining in and meeting with us by means of the webcast. And we pray that today the Lord will bless our hearts as we come together to study His Word. So Exodus 20, I want to read from verse number 18, Exodus 20, verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew, drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thine oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. And the Lord will bless the reading of His own Word to each of our hearts for His own name's sake. Now we are dealing with the subject of God's moral law, and, and specifically the, the line of thought, the Christian and the moral law. Now, the word law is it's a very simple word. We know that. We can see it clearly when we read it. It presents no difficulties to us, therefore, in the fact that it's simple in its form and, its, uh, and also in its meaning. But the issue that we have to face when we come to Scripture is how the word law is actually used in the Word of God. And in the Word of God, the usage of the word law is actually very complex in a certain sense. There's actually a wide variety in how it is employed in the Word of God. And so we need to take great care in order to understand how it is used and how it's employed by the Holy Spirit in order to understand what is meant in any given verse or passage where the Word is actually found. Now, let me give you an example of what I mean. That is, this, an example of how we must be very careful in our understanding of the use of the Word. It's not the Word itself, L-A-W. There's no problem with the Word. There's no problem with understanding uh, its form and its meaning in its own basic sense. But how do we understand it in terms of how it is used? Well, uh, two verses I want you to look at with me. Exodus chapter 2 and the verse number 15. And then Romans 3 and verse number 31. Look with me at these two verses, two statements from these two verses. This is to illustrate the point that the Word must be understood clearly in order to see how it is used. So Ephesians 2 verse 15, Paul says of Christ, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, Ephesians 2 15, Romans 3 31, you wouldn't be very good at sword drill, some of you people. <laughs> well, have you got there yet? Romans 3, verse number 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yes, we establish the law. So I'll keep talking here. Maybe you'll get the verses. Uh, Romans 2, Ephesians 2, 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments. Romans 3, 31. Do we, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yes, we establish the law. Now, in these two verses, first of all, we've got a certain verb used. If you look at Ephesians 2.15, it says, having abolished. And then in Romans 3.31, make void. 
Now, the English translation is different, but it's the same Greek word in the original language. And so, that's important to understand, because it's talking here about something being abolished, and then the term make void, which is, of course, the same idea. So, in the first verse, Paul states that Christ has abolished the law. In the second verse, he essentially says that the law does not, sorry, that uh, the believer does not abolish or make void the law. So, in one verse he's saying the law has been abolished, in the second verse he's saying the law hasn't been abolished. So, how do we understand this? Because here is the same word used in both verses, it is the word law, but we find that two different things are being said about the law. On one hand, it's been said that the Lord has abolished the law. On the other hand, it's being said that the law hasn't been abolished. So, how do we understand this? Well, here's the answer. And that's why I have said already the law, the word is used in different ways. And in Ephesians, it is the ceremonial law that's in view. And Christ has abolished the ceremonial law. But in Romans 3 verse 31, it is the moral law that's in view. And there the apostle Paul is basically saying that the Lord Jesus Christ has satisfied the law. He has not made it void. He has satisfied the moral law by His death. So, I want you to see how the word is used in those two verses, because you could read those verses and say to yourself, well, here's a contradiction. Paul says on one hand, the law has been abolished, and on the other hand, he's saying it hasn't been abolished. So, we have to understand how the word is used. And so, that brings me to say this, that in the Bible, there are three basic usages of the word law. And there are three kinds of law mentioned in the Scriptures, the moral law, the ceremonial law, and then the civil or the judicial law. So keep that in mind, the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law. Our own confession of faith makes this very clear that there is this, uh, this usage of the same word in the Scriptures, but signifying three kinds of law. And the confession of faith says, beside this law commonly called moral, God was pleased to give to the people of Israel ceremonial laws, to them also as a body politic, that means simply a nation, a body politic. He gave sundry judicial or civil laws. So the confession of faith reflects this, rightly so. The word law used mainly in three ways, taking the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the judicial or the civil law of Israel. The ceremonial laws, what were they? They had to do with the externals of Jewish worship. They had to do with uh, the way in which Israel came before God in the tabernacle and then in the temple. And you had all these different laws about animals that could be sacrificed. You had laws concerning the priesthood. You had laws concerning Israelites being clean or unclean when they came to worship God. And there's a, a host of laws in that sense. And they are the ceremonial laws or to put it in the singular, the ceremonial law of Israel with all these different aspects to it. Then they had to do, as I say, with Israel's worship. And actually, under the ceremonial law, there was a presentation of Christ in the gospel. And so when the Lord said to Israel, you're not to bring an animal, this was a law, you're not to bring an animal for sacrifice that has a blemish or that has a, a disease on it. He was saying that the Lord Jesus Christ will be without sin. When he said other things about, uh, the, say, the burnt offering, that it was to be offered completely, and every part of the burnt offering was to be consumed with fire, what was he teaching? By that law, he was teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ would die completely and entirely for the sins of men. So that was the ceremonial law, and there, of course, there's an awful lot more to it than that, but that's just an illustration and example of what I mean by the ceremonial law. Laws concerning sacrifices and the priesthood and the tabernacle and the temple and washings and so forth, and, and all these different details, even about the furniture of the tabernacle or the temple, and about the, the vessels that were used. It's all ceremonial. So there was the ceremonial law. And then there was the judicial law was God gave to Israel as a nation with regard to civil government. Now, keep in mind 
that it was enforced, that civil law was enforced among the Jews when they were under divine rule. And that is the only instance in all of history where an earthly nation was under the direct rule of God. Now, God, of course, is over all nations, but there never has been a nation in history where God directly ruled except with regard to the nation of Israel. They had what was called a theocracy. That means the rule of God. And I want you to understand this, because this is very important. And with regard to the rule of God in Israel, where God was ruling, that is, before there ever was a king, remember how later on they asked for a king, and the Lord was very displeased because they were rejecting him. First king of Israel was Saul. Now God gave them a king, but they had nothing but trouble thereafter. And even when they were been ruled by God, they didn't obey Him. And certainly when the kings began to appear, there was nothing but rebellion and trouble within Israel as time went by. But anyhow, prior to that period, God Himself was ruling directly. And in order to show His rule, He gave them this civil law, this judicial law, which had many, many peculiarities to it. Now, it was based to some degree on the moral law, that is the Ten Commandments, but it had it had uh, developments, it had inflections, it had uh, different aspects to it that were peculiar to Israel under this theocracy. And whenever the nation of Israel ceased to be, then that civil law ceased to be. The believer today, in other words, is not under the ceremonial law, and he's not under the judicial law in the sense that it was given to Israel. For example, you read about the civil law, and then God says you're to take the adulterer or the thief even and stone them to death. That no longer stands. We don't stone people to death. That was part of the judicial law. That has been abolished. There actually was a meaning to that. It had a spiritual meaning. Why did God say stone certain people to death? To teach that sin brings death. That was the reason for it. Now, if you listen to some programs on the radio or wherever, you will hear people bring these things up sometimes, and they'll mock, or they'll ridicule, and they'll say, what a, a terrible God, that He had people stoned to death, and so forth. And they don't understand that the, 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 the reason for that. Yes, it was under God's uh, th theocratic rule, and it was given by Him, but there was a reason for it. And I've just explained the reason. To teach Israel, if you sin, you will die eternally. Never mind die physically. And so there was this range of the use of the word law in that area of things. Those three major uh, forms of law that God instituted. The moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civil law, or the judicial law of Israel. They have been repealed. That is, the ceremonial law and the civil law. Christ fulfilled the ceremonial law completely and absolutely by His death, because the ceremonial law was continually pointing to Christ and the way of redemption. It was God's way of teaching His Old Testament people, here's how a sinner is forgiven, here's how you are washed from your sin, here's how uh, you're justified, here's why you need a priest, and so on. He was teaching the gospel, but He was always pointing to Jesus Christ, therefore. And then the civil laws went done away with, as I say, as well. But here's the point. The moral law has never been repealed. And I'm talking about the Ten Commandments. It has never been repealed. The testimony of Scripture, and this is the point that we're dealing with today, the testimony of Scripture is that the moral law is perpetually or permanently binding on mankind as a whole. It is not confined either to time or to place or to nation. It is binding throughout all time and throughout all nations. There was a great Scottish preacher called Robert Shaw, and he wrote an exposition of the Westminster Confession. He calls it the Reformed Faith, an exposition of the Westminster Confession, and he says this, in opposition to antinomians, and you've heard me use that word before, it means those who believe that we're not under the moral law. 
The word simply means no law. In opposition to antinomians who teach that believers are released from the obligation of the moral law, our confession teaches that the law is perpetually binding on justified persons, on Christians in other words, as well as others. You see, there are those who will tell the Christian, you're not under the moral law. And as I said before, the favorite one they want to get at is the fourth commandment about keeping the Sabbath day. And so they have to get around this, and so this is what they say, that we're not under the moral law anymore. The Christian isn't. But, well, these are the words of Shaw, and he's expounding the confession. But he's, what he's saying is, as a reflection of the Word of God. So we need to come and look at this. What are the proofs for the perpetuity or the permanency of the moral law of God? It's important to understand and to demonstrate this point and this fact, because the permanent authority, that issue of the permanent authority of God's law, is very, very vital for Christian living. This is the theme of this study, the Christian and the moral law. And every Christian here, and every believer listening to this broadcast, or who will hear this, uh, maybe in a CD, needs to understand this, that we are not exempt from obedience to the law of God as Christians. We have not been set free from giving the obedience it requires. We have been set free from its demands for perfect obedience in order to be justified. But we have not been released from its demand with regard to living a Christian life. This is how we live our Christian lives, by obeying God's law, by seeing what He requires of us. It is permanently or perpetually binding on the hearts of the Lord's people. Now, the giving of the law at Mount Sinai uh, shows its perpetuity or its permanence. Now, let me say this. We've read here in Exodus 20 about the Lord coming down on the mount. Just read a little extract there from Exodus 20. The Lord came down on the mount at Sinai. He gave the law to Moses. We must understand that the moral law was there from the very beginning. That wasn't the first time that men had heard the Ten Commandments, the moral law. The Ten Commandments, by the way, are a summary of the moral law. But anyhow, it wasn't the first time that the moral law had been given by God or had been heard by men. As we have already seen in our studies, the first few studies, the moral law was written on Adam's heart from the very time he was created. And it was passed down in that way to all men thereafter. And so, by, uh, so in that way, Adam knew that he should love God and obey God and furthermore, it was only on that basis of the law were written on his heart that Adam could be tested. But under that test, where God said to him, don't eat of that tree. Remember, that was a test of his love and a test of his obedience. But he couldn't have been tested if there was not a moral standard written within his very heart or, or being by which he knew that he was being tested and upon which God could justly test him as he actually did. And so the law was there from the beginning, the moral law. And then we notice that from Adam right through to Moses, the moral law was known. It was understood by men, even ungodly men. I want you to see this, for this is important. Turn to Genesis and look at a couple of verses with me. And I'm showing you in this way that the Ten Commandments were known by men from the very time uh, of Adam onwards. In fact, I want you to go to Genesis 9, first of all, and then we'll go to Genesis 20. Look at Genesis 9, verse number 6. And this is after Noah has come out of the ark. And there's an important verse, Genesis 9, verse number 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Why is murder wrong? Because man was made in the image of God, and therefore human life is not to be taken in that way by murder. But here is the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. That's essentially what we're looking at. It doesn't say it in that way, but 
the Lord's actually saying to uh, Noah here, or through Noah, uh, for this new era that's been ushered in with Noah coming out of the ark and beginning life all over again with his three sons and wives and then all the children that were born afterwards, he, he lays down this stricture that whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he, made he man. Now what had happened on the earth up to the flood? In the last period of time before the flood actually came, the earth was full of violence. The earth was full of murder, in other words. It was a time of awful bloodshedding. That is the inference of these words, because as soon as man comes out of the ark, God tells him, or reminds him of this commandment that mankind had already known about since the very days of Adam, from the very time of creation. And so here's the sixth commandment essentially being repeated. And so we have got that uh, insight here into the sixth commandment. It still stands. Then turn to Genesis 20 and look at verse number 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art <coughs> but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you'll find the same thing. Just turn, before we make any comments here, turn to Genesis 26 and verse number 10. You'll find the same thing in the days of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Genesis 26, 10. Abimelech said, What is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lion with thy wife, and thou shouldst have brought guiltiness upon us. What's he talking about in both cases? To Abraham and the days of Isaac, the, the, the focus is on the seventh commandment, dealing with adultery. Now, here's the, here's the point. God would have had no grounds for saying to these heathen men, these were heathen men, one had taken Sarah, one now takes Rebekah. And they had lusted for these women and had taken them. And if God hadn't stepped in and prevented the sin, it would have gone right through into physical adultery. But on what ground did God say to these men, uh, you, you, if, you took these, if you'd taken these women, you'd have sinned against me, and so forth? On what ground was he able to say that? Because the moral law was in vogue. You see, God cannot judge any man for sin unless on the basis of law. We saw that in one of these earlier studies as well. That great verse in Romans, Romans 4, 15, I think it is, where the Lord says, where no law is, there is no sin. In other words, sin cannot be called sin unless there is a law that has been violated. And here were men who were in danger of breaking a law, uh, and that's the inference of the words, and that law, of course, was the seventh commandment as we see it, or as we call it, when you look at the summary of the law given by the Lord in the Ten Commandments. So what I'm showing you is these are just two examples. We haven't time to do any more because we'll never get through this. But uh, these are examples to show you that from Adam to Moses, the moral law was there. The moral law was understood uh, even by those who were not God's people, uh, these heathen men whom we've just read about in Genesis. So then at Sinai, this is the point. At Mount Sinai, the law of God, the moral law that already existed and was already known by man, for the first time it was written down. And this is where people go entirely wrong. Uh, this is where dispensationalism makes a great mistake. They come to Sinai and they say that this is the first time that the Ten Commandments were ever given. I've just shown you that is not right. And then they go on from there to say that at Mount Sinai, God was revealing a way by which men could be saved. They were to keep the moral law. And dispensationalism has taught that down through centuries. You may not know what dispensationalism is. Well, you can get my series on it from some years back and listen to it. You'll get the CDs and listen to it all because it's a very important issue to understand what they teach, for it's still very prevalent in our little country. All around us in this town, there are evangelical churches that teach this thing called dispensationalism, which denies that the law of God is binding on the Christian's life. 
So they say that when God came down at Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments, this is the first time that this had ever happened. We've seen that is not right. Then they're saying this was a, a way of salvation. That is not right either. It was not a way of salvation because it was the Lord simply showing Israel, here is how you are to behave yourselves as my people. That's what he was doing. I'm putting it down now in writing. But going on from there, this underlines the perpetuity or the permanence of the moral law. For the first time, it was put in a written and a codified form. That had never happened before. Now it does happen at Mount Sinai. And there are two factors concerning the giving of the law in a written form at Sinai that actually underline that it's permanent. Number one, God actually spoke the Ten Commandments. And number two, God actually wrote the Ten Commandments. And let me just show you this quickly. Look at Exodus tw uh, 20 here and verse number 1. It says, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God. And then he gives the Ten Commandments. Then verse 22, the end of the verse says, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. So the Ten Commandments were delivered by God from heaven. Now that's very, very important. That actually was the only time in biblical history where such a phenomenon occurred, where God actually spoke from heaven to a people, giving them His law. Yes, there are other times when His voice was heard, but I'm talking here about the giving of, 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 a, of law by God. This is the only time this ever happened. So the Ten Commandments were delivered directly by God from heaven, by His own voice underlining the permanence of this law. Then, as I've already said, it was God who wrote this law at Sinai. It wasn't Moses. Most people have this wrong impression that Moses went up that mountain, took these two stone tablets with him, and uh, then he wrote down what God said, or chiseled it out. That is not what happened. Look at Exodus 24 and verse number 12. Exodus 24, the verse number 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, come up, uh, come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. Do you notice that? When Moses went up the mount, he didn't carry two tables of stone with him. When he got there, the Lord had the two tables of stone already prepared on which he had written the Ten Commandments. Look at chapter 31, for I want you to get this clearly. Chapter 31 and the verse number 18. And he gave on to Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony. Uh, the word testimony simply means witness. Two tables of testimony or witness. Tables of stone written with the finger of God. In chapter 32, verse 16, And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. Now, we do not know the mechanics of how, of, of, of how this all happened. In other words, it talks here about it being written by the finger of God and so on. We're not told how this all happened. But what we are dealing with here is the supernatural. We're dealing with God. And I don't know exactly how this all took place, how these two tables of stone uh, were formed in that sense, and the words were engraved upon them. But folks, we're dealing with God. We're dealing with the supernatural. And God could simply have caused this all to happen by, uh, just as He made the world by speaking. So we're not to question how it happened. What we are to look at is, it did happen. God wrote down the Ten Commandments on these two tables of stone, and then He handed them over to Moses. 
And therefore, every detail serves to underline the perpetuity of the law. In fact, some of you will know, most of you will know, that those first two tables of stone were then broken whenever Moses came down from the mount, Exodus 32, and he saw the golden calf and, and all of that, and those two tables were, were broken. And then, well, what happened then? Well, two further tables were prepared by God, and he wrote on them again, the Ten Commandments. You find that in Deuteronomy, but we're not take, going there today for, for time's sake. Uh, I mean, reading the verses, you can read that for yourself at some particular time uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 10. But go to Matthew 22, please. Matthew 22, and the verse number 37. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said unto him, uh, this is in response to the Pharisee, the, or a lawyer actually, as he was called. Matthew 22, verse 35 refers to a lawyer. That's, that's not a lawyer like we have a lawyer today, somebody up the street with an office uh, doing business. It's referring to a man who, was, who devoted his life to God's law. That's what's meant by the lawyer. And he asked the Lord this question, verse 36, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What is going on here when the Lord says these things? He's summarizing the law. But notice what the Lord does. The Lord summarizes the law into two tables. So if you take the first verse, 37, and also verse 38. You're reading there of, I'm suggesting to you, I believe this is the way it actually is. You're reading there of the first commandments dealing with the worship of God. That would be the first four commandments, because they have to do with God and His worship and His glory. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and right on through to the fourth commandment about God's day. And then the second table of the law, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, that has to do with the other six, from, from uh, honor thy father and mother, commandment five, right through to commandment ten. Uh, so what does the Lord do here? When he's asked the question about the law, he actually summarizes the law, and he does it in two parts, as it were. He's reflecting what happened at the very beginning or at Sinai, I mean, when the law was given in a written form, and God gave it in two tables of stone. In other words, the Ten Commandments were engraved on two tablets. And I believe, the light of what the Lord does in Matthew 22, we are given light and, and, and understanding of what was on the first tablet, the stone tablet, and what was on the second stone tablet. The very same thing as the Lord does in Matthew 22. The first four that deal with the glory of God and the, and the worship of God, and the other six that have to do with our relationship with people. But the point is, all of this makes it very, very clear that the law was given by God to be permanent. And let's be, let me say a few other things here. The Old Testament prophets, reminders and repetition of the law show its perpetuity. Now, in the Old Testament time, the priests of Israel were the custodians of the law. They were the men who were supposed to teach the law. You'll find that in Malachi. And again, I'm leaving that to you to read the references. Get the notes and look up these verses. But that's in Malachi 2, verses 4 to 7. God actually condemns the priests in Malachi's day for not teaching the law. He tells them, this was your work. This is what you should have been doing, but you haven't done it. And that happened down through Israel's history over and over again. And that was always the reason why God raised up prophets. The prophets of God, like Elijah or Moses or whoever, those men were only raised up when the priesthood of Israel apostatized, when the priests failed in their duty. And so God then would send a prophet or a number of prophets to call the nation back to God and to, and to call them to repentance. So please understand that. There weren't always prophets but there always was a priesthood. But when the priesthood went wrong, remember the priesthoods, the priesthood, those men in the priesthood were the custodians of the law and they were the teachers of the law, but when they failed, then God would send a prophet. 
Now, we must understand that. In order to understand why prophets keep appearing now and then throughout Old Testament history, they were unique. They had specific ministries. They weren't always there. But they were sent when there was this awful failure. And you'll find that in the case of Elijah. If you turn to 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse number 1, Elijah says something here that's remarkable. 1 Kings 17, verse number 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, Do you notice what we find here? Elijah just suddenly appears in the scene. You say to yourself, where did he come from? Well, we know he was a Tishbite. And that's kind of a mystery. Where, where, was, where was that place that's uh, under this title, Elijah the Tishbite? Well, we don't really know, actually. He was of the inhabitants of Gilead. Well, that narrows it down a bit. But anyhow, he's a kind of mysterious character, but it bears out the point of made the prophets just suddenly appeared. What does he say? As the Lord God of Israel liveth, he says this to Ahab, and Ahab was a wicked man. Ahab's an apostate. Ahab has led Israel astray, and a new form of religion has been introduced. It's a day of darkness. So along comes a man of God, and he says, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years. Now listen to this. But according to my word. Some people, again, look at Elijah, and they say, What an awful man. He comes and brings this judgment upon Israel, and this arrogant way, this arbitrary way. And he says, according to my word, there'll be no rain. But what is he doing here? He's saying, I'm simply telling you in my own words what God has already said in His Word. Because God had said through Moses long before this day that if His people Israel disobeyed Him, He would shut the heavens and there would be no rain. That's in Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 17. You can read those verses again sometime and say this for yourself. God had said this. So what's Moses doing here? He's appealing to God's Word or God's law even. And he's saying, here's the outworking, you see, of the first and the second commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and you're not to make any graven images. And if you do, I'll visit your sin upon you. And so when you read about God shutting the heavens and no rain, that is a working out of what He had said under those commandments. He said, I will punish you for your disobedience. Have you ever noticed, folks, in history, to this very day, across the face of this world, that the nations where there are so many pestilences and calamities are nations of idolatry, nations that do not obey God. That is true. That is a fact. And I'm showing the reason why. And in other words, the Old Testament prophets in their ministry, right throughout the Old Testament age, they keep appearing and they keep appealing to God's law. Whenever they arrive in the scene, they, they, have, they go back to the Ten Commandments. They call the people back to the law. That shows the permanency of the law. Christ and the apostles show the permanency of the, law, of the law. The Lord Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law, not destroy it. And you'll find it in His teachings, but then also in His own personal obedience, and especially in His death where he satisfied God's moral law. The Lord shows the permanency, the perpetuity of the law. Do you know that the Lord and his apostles, they quote all ten commandments? The dispensations will tell you there's no reference to the fourth commandment in the New Testament. That shows you they don't know the New Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ said, the Sabbath was made for man. And then there are other references to the Sabbath or the, the Lord's Day, one day in seven. They quote these commandments, Christ and the apostles. But then as I close today, for I had to hurry through here, here to me is the greatest proof of all, in a sense, of the fact that the law is permanent. And it's this, God's moral law will be the standard of judgment on the day of judgment. Judgment. 
if it doesn't exist anymore, if it's not binding anymore, then why will it be used in the day of judgment? Because it will be. Remember what we saw from Romans 3.20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. But in Romans 2.12, and then on to verse 16 it says, as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law in the day when God will judge the secrets of men. And one final reference, I know our time's a bit gone, but quickly, if Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. And look at these two verses, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What a statement that is. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And so we've been told here by Solomon, in this, perhaps you might call obscure book, here's the whole duty of man, fear God, keep His commandments. That's still, that's saying that it's still binding, but it goes a step farther. It says, do this, because God will bring every work into judgment. And the inference is, the law will be the standard of judgment on the day of judgment. What an awful day that will be. In fact, it makes sense, because God will only deal with sin, and God will only judge men on the basis of a moral standard. And since at the day of judgment, there's going to be the judgment of men for their sin, that means that the law that they have broken will be the standard of judgment. And so that proves to us the permanency of the law. All of it, all of it may I say, and so let us keep that in mind. We have to close, but most likely we'll get back to some of this next week. But I trust this helps you to see a very important thing about God's law, God's moral law, its perpetuity, its permanence. And may we, today as we come to a close, rejoice in this. Jesus Christ kept this law to save us from our sins. And that's where our hope lies. And out of love for Him then, for doing that for us, we delight in the Lord's law. You should delight in the fact there's only one true God to worship. That's so clear. And you should delight in the fact you don't need images and idols to assist you in worship. And you should delight in the fact God has given you a day in which to worship along with God's people. And all of this should delight our hearts. That's how to see the Ten Commandments. But let us pray. Lord, bless Thy Word today and use it in all of our hearts. And, O oh Lord, give us eyes to see and hearts to understand. And be with us now as we continue on in the worship of God and prayer and then into the morning service. And come down and visit us, we pray, in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.